we're here now to talk about the future. Yes, well, you know, we were just at a conference together about um, transhumanism, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, for instance, so we learned at, the, at this TEDx conference that um, there's, for instance, a Russian-based program that wants to, us all to transcend by 2045. Project 2045. Right. Yes. Right. Uh, uh, we will, uh, let's see, create um, avatars that are telepresent robots that we use from our, uh, from our homes to go out and trans-live around the world and then... Uh, it sounds a little like my novel, Killing People. Ah, it does. But um, the idea of, of being able to have telepresence with your um, uh, avatars that are first virtual, then robotic, mm -hmm. then bio-robotic, mm -hmm. and then the notion that uh, you would... Uh, consciousness uploading, consci downloading, side-loading. Consci consciousness like uploading, yes. <laughs> And these are all uh, very familiar, fascinating uh, notions uh, out of sci-fi that are now being taken seriously by people. And uh, I find myself again and again at these conferences. Uh, it's interesting. If, I, if I'm around people who are stuck in the myopic present, yeah. I'm one of the gung-ho singularity guys. <laughs> Wake up, snap out of it. Change happens. Yeah. You know, you guys are flying through the sky. Mm -hmm. You ask somebody, you know, who's curmudgeon about the future, have you ever flown through the sky? Mm -hmm. Have you ever walked into a room and made light happen with your fingertip? <laughs> <laughs> These are the powers of gods. And the reason we don't think of them as the powers of gods is Habituate. That, that's right. The same reason that uh, people actually got bored very quickly from the Apollo landings. And that is they were shared immediately with everybody. Well, that's painful to realize, but yeah, I guess you're right. Oh, yeah, yeah. You look at all the, um, all the people who um, put all that attention and, and um, an adoration to the Palantir globe in um, Lord of the Rings. Mm. A magical, glassy thing on your desk that will let you see any knowledge and, mm. and converse with people far away. Yes. Woo. <laughs> and uh, of course they're gushing over this thing while they have a magical screen on their desk <laughs> that lets them converse with people far away. It does exactly the same thing. And the only reason that the Palantir is better is because only the king and a couple of elves get it. <laughs> Restrict the supply. <coughs> Restrict the supply, it's more valuable. One of the best uh, hacks you can use if you're a university professor for a class that you have a hard time getting people into is you put on the uh, flyers that you circulate around the school. Only 100 people, only 50 people are allowed into this. That's school. right, that's right. And then you get lines out the door. Suddenly it becomes valuable. Well, you know, we, uh, we saw this in the news uh, just the other day that uh, Peter Diamandis and uh, James Cameron and um, a number of uh, other billionaires, Google billionaires. Yeah, it's very they're, they're enterprising. Page. Planetary resources? Yeah, they planetary resources mm -hmm. that are going to mine asteroids. And of course, mm -hmm. the, the biggest hoot was, was how uh, this was received on Jon Stewart. People <laughs> ought to uh, look at the YouTube of the, that Jon Stewart episode. <laughs> see that. Oh, it was amazing. Um, he's saying, oh, do we have to talk politics again tonight? Wait, we don't have to. There's something cooler. <laughs> and they, they, they show a news report about, about uh, mining asteroids. And he says, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> mining asteroids for trillions of dollars? And, and the audience of New Yorkers is just going ape. Just completely going ape. And he said, this is the kind of news in 2012 that we all thought we'd see in 2012. <laughs> Where's my jetpack, future boy? <laughs> I know. Where is it? La at last the future. This 2045 or 2050 that we're talking about. Yes. You know, the, world, the world in 40 years. Yeah, the world of your novel existence. Yeah, well, it's, it's set then, and the novel's coming out, and it's set in 2050. And, and the thing about the... Um, 
30, 40 year projection mm. that makes it both more difficult and so cool. And I yeah. enjoyed this so much with my other projection called Earth, was the uh, notion that it's this mix. If you, if you set something just five, 10 year, years from now, it's today's world, familiar world, with some, something has disrupted it. Something's yes. changed. Yeah. Some one thing. Maybe yeah. aliens have invaded, yeah. maybe everybody's dead, but some one thing. If you set it 200, 300, 400 years in the future, it's mm -hmm. playing tennis with the net down. You can say anything you want. You can... So many impacts, cross impacts, right. second, third order consequences. We've gone through one singularity and crashed, and now we're on working on our second. Um, <laughs> but the 30, 40 year projection. Well, if I were to go back to 1962 and, 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 and get my 12 year old self, pull him back up here 50 years, mm -hmm. he would spend half his time going, wow, we never thought of that. And the other half of the time he would be saying, you mean you're still doing that? And that's the <laughs> sense that you have to be able to convey in these 30, 40, 50 year projections. Mm -hmm this notion that some things will be disappointingly the same. Yes, and no matter how some things change, others just stay the same. That's yeah. right. And, and figuring out what, which of those things are going to be so and depressingly, or in some cases, uh, reassuringly st uh, stable. And when we are uploaded into Android bodies with IQs of 496, adolescent males will still, still spend one third of their time thinking about things they shouldn't, and another one third <laughs> wincing over <laughs> stupid things they said. Yeah. And still wincing about them 50 years later. Well said. Yeah. Uh, but in any event, um, what else 50 years from now? Well, you, you think we're going to transcend. Uh, yes, I uh, uh, appreciated your uh, discussion, or your calling me out on that in your presentation of TEDx uh, talk. Uh, I do. I, I believe that um, the uh, history of intelligence in the universe is, uh, involves colonizing ever smaller scales, ever more local slices of space-time, and using ever less are using resources ever more efficiently per computation. So virtualizing our resources, getting to a place where we're doing virtually everything with virtually no physical resources. And this seems to be the history of complexity development when you move from galaxies to replicating special replicating stars within those galaxies to special uh, surface, surfaces on the sliver of these special planets between magma and vacuum where all the interesting things happening. And then, then these special subsections of those that are most hospitable to replicating life, and then these special life forms. Special life forms. Uh, now we're manipulating quantum computers. We're doing quantum encryption. Uh, we we've sent neutrino messages through the solid Earth recently. But this we're but going the, into inner space. And, and this is all fabulous, but mm -hmm. it, it it runs contrary to the science fiction notion that our future, our destiny, our final frontier is out there in doing mega structures in mega civilizations and uh, you think that this is the answer to the so-called Fermi paradox what I've called the great silence yes yeah I, I and it, I don't know if it really does run, run counter what it does is it it says that the frontier that we thought was the frontier this uh, expansion into outer space uh, is cold and sterile mm -hmm, may actually not be the frontier the frontier is still there but the exploration the discovery is really jumping into this inner space world. That's where the real computational resources, the real new uh, ability to understand things, the next level of sublime, if you will, well, seems well, to be, we actually seem to be chasing into that as we're thinking, as we're thinking about these grand explorations. Now, I do believe that there is what I call the next adjacent. There's a next adjacent expansion that always happens in order to reach the next level of inner space. Humans went through a next adjacent expansion from uh, these colon from Africa, right, the modern human, expanding out across the globe. That was a next adjacent, that was an outward, that was an outer space move. But the reality is we were only colonizing a small subset of the space that the prokaryotes had 
very effectively colonized long before us, miles deep into the crust of the Earth, autolithotropic bacteria, out to uh, Venus well, and, and, yes, uh, and but, Mars but, on asteroids. But they needed us to take them to the moon. Good point. Well, no, I don't know if they did. I, I would say the asteroids skipping off of, uh, of Earth probably distributed spores of bacteria all the way out uh, uh, to many of the other planets. Well, I talk about that to a large degree in Heart of the Comet. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's the uh, Panspermian Ocean. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, what you're talking about is going to depress some people in certain ways because they see this as just an extension of the video game. We're getting in and in and in and in and in, and even mm -hmm. if it becomes these vast virtual realms mm -hmm. to explore, mm -hmm. it's nevertheless a turning away from well, an older dream. Well, it is a. It, it, it might not be. Well, well, of here's course a, here's you think question. it is here's because you think it explains the silence out there right. that almost every species out there yes. discovers these inner realms. Yes, and these inner realms are are more persuasive and, and let, attractive. Yes, and let me correct a small misunderstanding we seem to have on, with regard to uh, this question of does this answer Fermi's paradox? I believe that if we are diving into these things that look more and more like a black hole from our perspective, these inner space, highly dense realms, censored from our observation, um, I do agree with your notion that there will be biker gangs. There will be people who will disagree. There, there will, will be, be exceptions. Committed colonizers, uh, grand uh, explorers who who want to who want to leave. However, if the universe is not just evolving, it's also developing, as I've argued, and you know my Evo Devo Universe community discusses this. Right? Then it's quite possible that the inner space attractor is a, an attractor that has a force proportionate to the complexity of the organism. In other words, they impose law on the galaxy and they curb the few exceptions who want to expand and, um, and change and manipulate the, the, the cosmos. That's the, certainly one thing is, that we, is, would is that we would do. There would be the um, prime directive that would emerge in all these advanced planets. Don't go out and send... In, and uh, Because if we're all going into this inner space world, and let's assume the physics work out so that we all instantaneously connect with all the others in the civilization by doing that. So that's one thing that would make it highly attractive. I can go in and now I can instantaneously wormhole or whatever the else speed with everybody of, else. The speed of light and temporal, um, and temporal uh, uh, coincidence both mitigate against that. But we'll leave that aside well, and take your assumption. In my, in my paper, I argue that the, weird, the weirdness of, of my paper, The Transcension Hypothesis, which was published in ACTA Astronautica last uh, year, I argue that the, the weirdness of black hole time dilation is such that if we were able to go into a, uh, a black hole, a black hole-like object, yeah. we would instantaneously, from our reference frame, merge gravitationally with all the other black holes that are in the gravity well with us. Well, that's, that's a perspective. I don't think Stephen Hawking or Kip Thorne would agree, but... We can set that aside for another time. You're basically saying that when you enter into the realm near an event horizon, you're in connection with all the other event horizons. I'm saying that the, that, uh, the way space-time dilation works, the extreme space-time dilation that happens at a black hole, and this, there's, of course, black hole physics is one of the hardest things to get anybody around the room to agree on, but this is one of the oldest models of how space-time works. This is one of the most original, classical... Uh, um, you know, Meissner talks about it in gravitation, right? Of how basically, you know, the astronaut that's moving in to the, they basically are frozen on the event horizon. And from your perspective, you're looking out at the, at the universe, everything in the universe instantaneously moves towards its heat death. So basically a black hole event horizon is an instantaneous one-way forward time travel device in well, that perspective. Yeah, that's clear, but the business of being in, connected with all other singularities, well, let's set that aside for another time. All right. You're the, you're the point you're, you're driving at is that the exceptions 
to this business of being attracted into inner space, mm -hmm. and you believe that most civilizations, most races are attracted to the inner world of unlimited virtuality, mm -hmm. that the exceptions, the motorcycle gangs who try to claim the universe, yeah. might be stopped from doing so by the vast power of those who want the maximum diversity in the cosmos yes. and have this power because they have this ultimate virtuality and computational ability. Yeah, if we can make the claim that sending out a one-way message on your way into this hole, this transcension, is going to condemn all the other civilizations that receive that message or, or probe or whatever you send to going down their holes in the same way you did, then we can say that you've, cl you've created clonality in the computational, that sector of the galaxy. Okay. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> so you would end up seeing yourself, a clone of yourself, on the other side, right? I think... I wouldn't be the same of you, of course, but what you would have done is you would have reduced the diversity the remaining diversity, you'd have taken away what um, Arthur C. Clarke liked to say, uh, I think it might, it might make more sense for us to figure out our own problems than to have them spoon-fed to us from another alien. As, and, as that, and that may be very well why, yeah. irrespective of the black hole, mumbo-jumbo, mm -hmm. um, uh, that may be why advanced races insist on a prime directive a non-interference yeah. policy in order to maximize the diversity so that young races like us can have time to develop interesting differences. Yeah. And of course that is very appealing to the culture that we came from where we um, appreciate argumentation, we appreciate difference, we mm -hmm. appreciate diversity. It's almost a religion in this culture mm -hmm. where it wasn't in many human cultures. Mm -hmm. But on that thought, I think maybe we'd better um, give our brains a little rest. That sounds good. Okay, we'll pour ourselves some more tea and uh, <laughs> welcome people back another time. <laughs>